Okay, so thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, this event is being hosted by the Student Race Equality Steering Group. Um, and if you've not heard about us before, we're a really new group, to, to, to be honest. Um, about a few months we've been running. Um, and basically, just to give you a bit of background, it came in light of the George Floyd killing while murder. Um, and students were challenging Cardiff University to ask, what are you doing? Basically, what's your response to this? What have you been doing historically to battle um, issues of race? Um, what's your response? So the Cardiff University sent out an open letter to students to basically say, here's a few groups that you can um, participate in. Here's our response to this. Um, we're committed to this and that diversity and inclusion. Um, and one of those groups was the race equality working group um, with a contact. So our chair now, who's Abid, um, he is part of the School of Sociology and he works in social care. So um, about 30 people reached out to Abid, basically saying, how can we participate in this group? Um, we're really interested, we want to actually do some action here, um, but specifically at the university. Um, and Abid kind of puts all together in one room, in one, one meeting, and basically said, it's up to you. Um, it wasn't really an established group. There was a staff side to the race equality group, but not a student side. So from then, a few of us took it upon ourselves to basically say, well, we don't really want to wait every month to just do a drop-in meeting. We want to do things now. We want to start getting the ball rolling. Um, so a few of us started saying, let's make this into a group um, where we focus on student voices um, and we focus it on the issue of race. Um, so since then, we've been hosting a few events. We had Black History Month events with historian Abby Backer, which went brilliantly. Um, and now we've got an event celebrating Black Excellence, Black Enterprise on Black Friday. So it's very, very fitting, I think. Um, so we've got some brilliant business owners for you to hear from today. Um, you're, you're really lucky to have them here. And I'm so grateful that they've actually came to speak to us. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and a real range of businesses as well. We have Aaron Wallace by Aaron Wallace Cosmetics. Um, hair care but you're starting to work on skincare as well specifically catered for black men and what they need um yuna muhammad um director of Wyana naturals um in the process of formulating some really brilliant products catering to afro hair um we have proved butterworth which is teaching you how to dominate in um, markets and startup businesses what tips that they need to know uh, and finally we can't have her here today but from my nails manicure you nails um, she is tackling the issue of a lack of inclusivity in a lot of nail colours and nail brands. So we have a video for you to see today. Um, unfortunately, because Nicola can't be with us today, so this is Manicure You Nails. Um, I'll just share my screen quickly so you can hear a bit more about her. Uh, can everyone see that? Yep. Yep. Hi, my name is Nicola and I'm the founder and CEO of MY Manicure U. Um, a big hello to everyone at Cardiff University Racial and Equality Steering Group. I'm so sorry I'm unable to join you in person today, but I'd like to thank you for supporting my brand and allowing me to record this video. So Manicure You is a beauty brand designed for nails that want to be cared for and kept looking beautiful at all times. We are all about enhancing the beauty of nails and achieving a flawless manicure at home. We specialize in high shine, toxin free and cruelty free nail care and polish. Our statement colors are inclusive of all skin tones and the name Manicure You is all about self care, taking time out to pamper yourself and just having that quality me time. So I've always loved painting my nails and getting my weekly manicure, but after years of having acrylic nails and gel nails, which just totally ruined my nails, I decided to look after my natural nails. So in 2015, I became a blogger, posting pictures about my nail growth, nail tips, and showcasing colors from different brands. But I soon realized that many of these brands were still using very harsh chemicals in their products, which stained nails and caused breakage. Some of these um, toxins were camphor and xylene, which are commonly used in paints to stop them cracking. I also found that the brand's colors were not inclusive and did not complement or provide nude shades for people like me. So I wanted to create a product that is inclusive of all skin tones, toxin-free, and would allow my nails to breathe and be nurtured 
and grow whilst I was still rocking the latest shades. I also wanted the product to show luxury with affordability and this is why I created Manicure You. So in 2018, this was whilst I was still on maternity leave, I launched Manicure You with seven colours. We now have 21 colours and a nail care range consisting of a top coat, a base coat, nail files and our famous vanilla rose cuticle oil enriched with vitamin E. Running a small business is very, very hard, but it's also very rewarding. It is my passion for my brand and my determination that really keeps me going. Every colour is created with every skin tone in mind, and it is important to MY that everyone is represented. I'd like to thank you so much for allowing me to introduce my brand to you. I love what you guys are doing. I love your platform, and I just want to say keep going, and I hope to speak to you soon. Thank you. So that was Nicola Saramekin of Mamaka U Nails. She is a brilliant entrepreneur, and the fact that she's done that on maternity leave launched her business on maternity leave is insane. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Jess, uh, our co-chair of the group, um, so that she can introduce you to the rest of our business owners. Hello everyone, thank you for that introduction Izzy, and thank you to all the uh, CEOs who've come with us today. Um, I must say, I'm already wearing Manicure You, so I can say they're a very good brand and dad's birthday. So I have the set yeah. and then I just remembered it's my brother's birthday. So I'm gonna have to go in again, but um, it's good to see some prestige brands on the market from our people and they're doing fantastic. So thank you all for coming here today and giving us your time and supporting us throughout. I know there's a lot of emails that have gone back and forth behind the scenes to get you here. And I really appreciate you all being here. So I think we should move it on to Aaron Wallace next, seeing as I, oh, sorry, I just have to say, very cool uh, <laughs> opening, <laughs> but it's very cool. And then also, I have to just point out, it's a Dr. Yumna Muhammad, because she is like, it's super intelligent, so we'll be hearing from her in a minute also. So over to you, Mr. Aaron Wallace. Hi. Um, so... Thank you for having me. Um, it's an honour to be here. Um, I always get a little bit nervous with these type of things, so bear with me. Um, I will, so essentially I'll just take you through the journey of Aaron Wallace and kind of how we got to where we are today. And since we've got a little bit more time, I'll, I'll go back just a little bit further than I, than I usually would. So um, it, the journey kind of began out with the barbershop actually. So we had, a, um, I had a barbershop that I was running in East Croydon and the name was Sheer and Shine. That kind of began through just me being a customer of the barbershop. And I found that when a lot of the barbershops that I was going to at the time, um, very few and far between was I getting a good service. I found that many, and I, was, I wasn't getting the best service and the waiting times was, as a busy person, it was just, it's like you had to, block your whole day out to go to the barbershop and get a haircut and I just felt that there was um, an area for there was a lot of room for improvement there so when I originally launched the barbershop the vision at the time was to become like uh, my benchmark was Tony and Guy so I wanted to have a really premium quality experience for um, Afro, Afro uh, black customers and that was kind of the original vision as when I got started with the barbershop. Now, getting up and running with a, a physical premises and hiring staff and especially barbers who, are, who work self-employed, that was a whole journey in itself. And there's loads of stories there. So if anyone has questions in regards to that, I've got loads of anecdotes there. Um, but then how I kind of ventured into the into the product side of things was essentially just through cutting hair every day um, speaking with my customers every day as their barber you kind of become like their hair doctor as well so any questions that they have in regards to their skin or their hair they will always come to their their barber first so I was getting a lot of similar questions such as how do I get my beard to grow or my beard is patchy what can I do um, 
uh, my hair's receding. Is there anything that I can use to kind of slow down the receding of my hairline? Um, things like that. What I also noticed was that many of my customers, a lot of the issues that, were, that they were facing was essentially caused by dryness. So, for example, I will be cutting a client's hair. And it's funny because you'd you be cutting a client's hair and you'd be like, oh, bro, you know, your hair's quite dry, you know, it's, it's a little bit dry, it's a little bit flaky. And a lot of the time, the response that I would get was, yeah, yeah, I've got dry hair. Yeah, man, I know I've got dry hair. And it was kind of like, the next thing would be like, okay, but you know, you don't necessarily have to have dry hair. So what I realized is that a lot of men, because we weren't as conscious of our hair care and our grooming, we kind of just accepted our, I've just got dry hair. Like that's just, that's just how my hair is. So that I realized that there was an element of education there as well. So essentially, there was two main factors. One was that there was uh, education, lack of education with their hair and grooming. And two, it was very difficult for men to find the products to use on their hair. So at those times when, when they would ask me these questions and I would say, well, you know, try this or try that. The next question would always be, okay, where do I get these products from? And at the time, it's like it was very few and far between to find an Afro hair shop. So it became like a treasure map, a treasure hunt. So the first part of the treasure hunt was to find an Afro hair shop. And then once you find the Afro hair shop, most of the products that were in there were all catered to women. So there was a lot of products that were catered to women. So the second part of the treasure hunt was once you found the shop, you have to find the small corner that actually caters to products for, for men. And then once you find that like one shelf at the back of the shop, there's only like one or two lines that were being carried. And most of them were being imported from the U S and they were really old school, like petroleum based products. So, Essentially, I've realized that there's a huge need here because there are loads of men, black men that are suffering with these issues and no one's really servicing them. And as their barber, as their, their hair doctor, so to speak, it's only right that I offer a solution to that. And if I'm and at the time, my, my mentality was if I'm trying to create a premium barbering experience, I should be the person to offer them a solution to those problems. So that's kind of how we began the journey of the Aaron Wallace um, grooming range. So we initially initially launched as Sheer and Shine Grooming. And at the time it was just, we was able to find a small manufacturer who was able to kind of make products that were as close as possible to what we needed for Afro hair. So we originally launched as Sheer and Shine. And then as the company grew um, and uh, we was able to get some investors on board as well, we decided that we wanted to reformulate the products like from the ground up. Like, so we was able, we was fortunate to be in a position where we could now literally individually select each individual ingredient that goes into the product and create something completely unique to our, to the specific, to our exact specific specification that we wanted. And um, so during that time, we took a little hiatus from Sheer and Shine to really go back to the, to the drawing board and develop everything again from the ground up. And so that's when we kind of looked at who exactly is our customer? Who are we targeting? So it's great to say black men, but black men come in all different shapes and sizes and that we have all different types of needs. So we really sat back and took it back to the drawing board and looked at exactly who are we talking to? How are we trying to reach them? So once we kind of had our, our ethos and our brand story and what we were trying to do and who we were trying to target, we was then able to, re to really be focused on what are the issues that we wanted to tackle and how are we going to communicate those issues to our customer. So with all of that taking place and redeveloping the website, redeveloping the, the packaging itself, redeveloping the formulations, we, we literally redeveloped everything. So we felt that, you know what, this is no longer sheer and shine. This is a whole new, this is a whole new thing that we're doing now. And um, 
yeah so we, we we went through many many different names when we were changing the name over we went through so many different names and um just going through the legalities and all of that kind of stuff and the trademarks we went back and forth with so many different names and eventually we got to the point where we was like well essentially this is the journey of the brand is all about it's been your journey with the customers and solving the issues and you also represent the customer that you're trying to cater to as well so we just said you know what, let's just make this easy and call it Aaron Wallace Grooving so that's how we ended up where we are today and um, yeah since we've launched we launched um, we launched a new brand last year officially and um, yeah we've just been we've been growing growing pretty rapidly ever since and um, like I said there's there was a huge gap in the market that we're filling and um, due to that we've been able to grow like pretty pretty fast um, yeah so um, that's where we are today so any questions let me know brilliant um, well I have a question about how was your experience finding funding was it more in your inner circle or did you go to um, institutions or I'm not really like familiar about funding so funding, I would say, was quite a tricky one. I would, in the early stages, so in the, in the very beginning, when I was launching the barbershop and Sheer and Shine and all of that stuff, I basically, I was able to secure a small startup loan from the government. I um, sold my car, which helps, and savings. So small loan, government, uh, savings and selling my selling anything that what any basically any any way I could scrape all the money together was how I got going in, in the in the very beginning stages to get the ball rolling and get like a concept to market um how we so after that how we got the funding to grow after that was basically because we had a proven concept that we was kind of on the market world with it kind of came about through one of the branding companies that we was working with. They knew someone who was looking for someone in our niche to kind of uh, work with. And because we had a proven concept, we was able to do business together and we was able to, so we basically secured private funding um, to help us to grow to the next stage. So in terms of funding, I would say always just, just start with what you have like start with what you have to get the ball rolling because unless you get the ball rolling and, and unless you kind of like prove that there's there's something there to begin with it's difficult to get that next larger round of of funding cool and um in terms of like you've mentioned marketing and i obviously follow you on instagram so i can see that you are a prestige brand is that something you have control over or is that something you outsource with your marketing or is it a bit of both so, how do you get that image so i uh, so my co-founder lena she handles our marketing and i would uh, i would say to you guys one of the best pieces of advice is to really have a strong team or re like when you find valuable people, really nurture and, and stay and work with those valuable people. So you guys that are in university right now, if you have people that really, that you work well with and that are really talented, stick with those people and grow with those people. So myself and Lena, we had been business partners from before I even launched the Sheer and Shine Barbershop. We was working on one of her old businesses previously. So we've been in business together for quite a while and her main focus is on the marketing. So she, she, she's a, um, a marketing ex-grad, so she studied it. And so when we done our whole rebranding exercise, one of the key things that's really helped us is identifying exactly who our customer is and that helps you to really streamline all of your communication going forward so all of your you want to make sure all of your communication is speaking to the person that you that you want to sell to in a way that they understand and in a way that they connect with and when you have a brand story a strong brand story that connects emotionally with the struggle that they're going through as well that really helps so marketing on on marketing is essentially communicating 
that brand story in the in the best way possible so that when people come to your page or your website just from a snapshot they can see exactly what you're about they can see what your ethos is and who you are just from a snapshot okay cool and um, one last question before i shoot it over to dr huna mohammed um any big plans for 2021 that you can reveal um so the main one we've got a few plans and my main goal for aaron wallace is i really want us to be the, the first thought for black men when it comes to anything to do with their hair and their skin and their grooming. So we've began our range with hair care because obviously that's my, back, my, my key background as a barber, but we really want to expand into um, skin care and body care and just grooming as a whole. There's so many different tools and, and products that we use in our grooming that we've often had to steal products from our, from our uh, female girlfriends and sisters and mothers and stuff to, to, to cater for. So there's so much room to grow in that so that, you know, we won't have to keep stealing anymore from you guys. But um, early next year, we are planning to launch our skincare range. So that's coming next. Um, another issue that a lot of men uh, uh, face is with ingrown hairs. So black men especially are very, very prone to ingrown hair. Primarily especially when you shave with a cutthroat razor. So when you use the razor, I always say what you're actually doing is taking off the very top layer of skin. So if you have Afro curly hair, it's very prone when the hair is growing back under that layer of skin to curl back in on itself and, and cause those ingrown hairs. So with our skincare range, that's something that we primarily want to address as well. But all whilst maintaining our values of being a... Um, natural premium quality brand. Brilliant, thank you very much. That sounds very exciting. Um, everyone, you can follow Aaron Wallace on, on Instagram at by Aaron Wallace, and I've put everyone else's contacts there in the link. Also, you should also give Mayana underscore Natural to follow, which is um, the company by um, Dr. Yuna. Muhammad, sorry, and um, because she is about to launch her product, which is top secret, and it's fabulous. I, and she is looking out for 50 women who want to test her product because she's in the trial phase. Um, you should jump at that chance. So do give her an email. You can find her website as well. Just Google Mayana Naturals, you'll find her. So please, Dr. Yumna Muhammad, please, the floor's to you. Hi, Jessica. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, you know, after introducing me, you can just go for Yumna. It's okay. <laughs> oh, you know I like doctor. <laughs> uh, first, I want to say thank you, Aaron, because my brother does that to me constantly. He steal my hair care product <laughs> for himself. So I think there'll be lots of women and sisters out there that are, are very grateful for your work. Um, so uh, anyway, so I'm really glad to be here. Thank you, Jessica, for the invitation and giving me this opportunity. So uh, in preparing this, uh, this short presentation, I was kind of like, uh, I, was, I took some time to reflect. And the one thing that really came out to me regarding um, is actually the, the, the title, you know, Black Excellence. And I wanted to also uh, take the time to actually uh, reflect about what does excellence mean to me. And the conclusion I came up to is that for me, excellence means simply uh, taking opportunity to seek things that fulfills me and things that are things that I actually desire to do as a human being. Okay. Because I think success or excellence is actually a very personal thing. So I wanted to put that across to start with. So to be able to understand the stuff that I am actually, um, uh, I actually like to engage and decide to seek my own form of excellence. Uh, I, I kind of need to tell you a little bit of a, my, my background story and my history. So, uh, I'm from a very small island in the Indian Ocean between Madagascar and Mozambique. Uh, it's called Mayotte. Uh, please go check it out on Google because I have yet to meet 50 people in the UK who know where it is after 12 years. So I always like to, to let people know where I'm from. Uh, and uh, growing up there, you know, it's a French island. So, you know, I learned the French anthem in school and I felt very much French. The official language is French. 
And um, at the age of seven, my parents moved to France and I was like so excited by the simple idea of going to France because I was like, I'm going home, you know, that I belong to that place. And um, when I moved to France, actually, it was quite an interesting, uh, it, it was quite a challenging move because uh, unfortunately I felt French, but that's not was, that was not the opinion of my peers. And I first actually discovered uh, and experienced racism. And although at that time I didn't know the meaning of inclusivity, I actually definitely felt the consequences on non-inclusivity. And that was kind of a defining uh, moment for me as an individual. And so growing up in France, especially in the poor area of, of, uh, uh, of Marseille, um, I always felt like, you know, some form of identity crisis where I felt like I need to leave, you know, there is, they, they can't, there has to be a better place or, you know, I just didn't want to, to, to actually evolve in that space. Anyway, fast forwarding that opportunity came through actually thanks to a failure in the in a course that I was doing, um, I decided to uh, move uh, to the UK to pursue uh, a master's to, to, to come as an Erasmus student. And I really enjoy my experience as an Erasmus student. We are meeting so many international students. But then I actually decided to stay as a home student after my Erasmus year. And things changed a bit because I was doing a master's in physics. So to start with in physics, you barely have uh, very few women. But on the top of that, we were 22 students and we were two women and I was the only person of color in the whole class. And that was a very, um, a very isolating experience where uh, it affected my grades simply because I didn't have the peer-to-peer -peer interaction to actually, uh, that is necessary to just get that learning process. But also it went to the point of affecting my, my mental health. And, um, and um, I managed to power up through by doing quite lots of, uh, to just kind of keep on pushing, went on and actually got my PhD and actually started working in Swansea University doing research in the field of printed electronics. So printed electronic is a field where we use common printing technique to actually print electrical devices like solar panels, solar cell, printed, printed sensors and stuff. And I loved it for two years. But then slowly this kind of emptiness and this kind of void start creeping on me where I felt like, you know, there was, this is not, I didn't see myself evolving as an academic because that's not what I wanted to do. And it looked good from outside, you know, like uh, my family member were just like, oh, we are so proud of you. But actually I didn't feel, I didn't feel fulfilled and I felt very empty. So I started asking myself, what are the things that are valuable for me as an individual that I could seek to do whether at work or outside of work that will just allow me to feel, feel much more uh, fulfilled about, about life. And one thing that has always been close to me for different reasons is actually gender equality for STEM. Because as I said, there is very little representation of women. And so I was always involved in the university with things like Athena Swans or, you know, um, soapbox science. And I got to a point where I realized that my experiences as a black woman, as a woman of color, were not actually being represented. And so that's kind of was the key point into deciding to build a very similar structure to uh, what uh, you guys have built in, in Cardiff, which is in Swansea University, I built the uh, BME network within uh, the College of Engineering. And the mindset with that was really focusing into trying to educate the staff uh, uh, at the lecturers about the reality and the challenges that uh, that um, ethnic minority face, which is very similar to what I faced as a student, but also ask, get them to reflect about how can they uh, come along to actually create a space where it's much more inclusive for the students. But it was also an opportunity to educate the students about all of those invisible walls, which actually are not invisible when you take the time to actually study the processes, to actually manage to make sure that your career, you can, you can actually uh, push your ambitions at uh, how, however how far you wish as an individual. And uh, to my surprise, things actually uh, blossomed quite quickly. And we got to the point of actually uh, raising funds and having funds for 10 PhD students to, have to, get, a, to get a coaching leadership course, which is kind of a great opportunity. Uh, and then we got funding to actually have a master, two master students to fully support the network, engaging with the student in the engineering department to understand the challenges. And that is something that I just did because it mattered to me. And uh, the outcome of that was, 
very uh, rewarding the uh, to be nominated Women Inspire 2020 and actually winning it uh, in August because uh, for me it was just something that I did for fun. While that was going through and I enjoyed it and I, I felt very passionate about it, I knew that I did not necessarily want to train to become a diversity consultant. And, uh, and I actually love research. I love the process of having a problem and actually using physics, you know, that whole engineer, ingenuity and uh, 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 creativity aspect to actually solve a problem. And there was something that I always, I had always told myself that if I can solve the problem, I will. And to kind of explain the problem, I need to take you back a little bit in my story. So when I was a PhD student, the final year of my PhD, uh, I was a living nanny simply because it, it's the final years of PhD tend to be quite straining financially and you just need to, to survive. And I was looking up to this beautiful girl and um, every every morning will have the same story. Every morning she will cry, it's like, mommy, I want my hair in a ponytail. Mommy, why is my hair no straight? And it really saddened me to actually hear her go to, to that process and the whole thing will get even worse on Sundays because she was getting her hair washed. And after the washing, you apply the conditioner and you know the tears would get even heavier. But I didn't quite understand what, why she kept on wanting to have her hair in a ponytail. And one day as I dropped her to school, I, I went to, to, to the toilet before leaving. And I enter the toilet and there is kind of like five girls following each other and they are all doing each other's hair and they all had straight hair and all of them in ponytail. And that was like kind of like the moment where the penny dropped. I was just like, oh my God, bless her. She simply wants to be able to belong to the group that she, that she identified with. And I could really relate to that with my own personal story regarding my experiences in France, but also my experiences as a, as a, as, as a student, um, being a, a minority as a student. And so it's always stayed with me, like, if I can change something about that problem, I will. And that was my opportunity. Now I had the R&D research, uh, uh, knowledge. So, um, and I realized the one thing that was the most painful for her on the Sunday was actually the process of applying lotions to the hair. So to apply lotion for Afro hair, for people who don't know, as a woman, we part our hair into different sections, and then we put the cream in our hands, apply it to the hair, and then have to detangle with a comb. And it can not only take time, but it's also painful. So I've invented what I call a detangling applicator comb, which enables to apply and distribute lotions or conditioner whilst also detangling. And um, it, was a, it was a side hustle for two years while working for the university, doing my research, doing the VM network, I was actually doing this on the side. And things, uh, things kind of evolved. I actually filed a patent and this year I was awarded uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering Enterprise Fellowship, which is a fellowship that is awarded to engineers with innovative ideas that wanna take their project to market. And things have been accelerating thanks to this fellowship. And last September, I had a project trial. We had seven women to just make sure we to test the working mechanism. And I was really, really pleased because uh, out of the five moms we had, the team, the common team was uh, one woman said, oh, this product will really enable my daughter to enjoy the process of getting her hair done. And the mom said, oh, this product will enable my daughter to actually learn to love her hair. And that was really like an amazing moment for me because I'm like, that's actually what I set to achieve as a person. And actually having that feedback was really rewarding. So currently I'm in the process of doing uh, more, uh, uh, more uh, ergonomic work to just improve the user the user experience and we are looking for 50 women across Wales to take part to this to this trial and it, it, it will simply involve getting our product the detangling applicator come for free and you trial it in your home for two weeks and then just take part to a, an online survey and a focus group so I will really welcome your support when it's come to that uh, 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 to follow the um, and I can tell you a little bit more about that once you follow me on the social media. So with that all say, I also wanna give you, I also want to tell you about what I believe was essential for me to actually leave 
the meaning of my excellence as an individual. And the first thing I would say, one thing that was really important for me to work on to do is actually seek self-development. So um, the, when I say self-development, because sometimes we, we tend to tell to people, you know, oh, work on your strength, focus on your strength. But it's actually very important to raise your self-awareness and also know your weaknesses and, as an individual. When I say your weaknesses, I'm not speaking, you know, are you not a, a good, are you not an organized person? Are you not a team worker? I go deeper than that. We speak a lot about things that are called self-limiting beliefs. Self-limiting beliefs are beliefs that we have about ourselves that are not necessarily true, but because of our life experiences, we believe they are, and it's of impact that we, in, we interact with the world, do we interact with people. So I think it's very important to identify those beliefs and actually break them because it really enable you to actually unleash your full potential and strive. The next advice I will say, I will say seek challenges. So today I'm here, I'm speaking to you. Last year I was in Mexico giving a whole day workshop of our sprinted solar cells. Is the same individual seven years ago where I was invited to actually do a talk in a school with a group of 11 young girls I built out. I just didn't feel confident enough to do that. And um, the whole thing is to say that I knew I wanted to do it, but somehow I felt I was not confident about it. And so what I did outside of work and I try to seek challenges for myself, challenge myself, do things that actually interest me, but also scares me. So for example, I simply started teaching dance because it's something I've always wanted to do and I was curious about. And once I did that, I was like, okay, what else can I do? I found myself in the middle of Swansea City Center speaking about science to people who definitely didn't want to, didn't want to hear about science, but I managed to engage them in such a way that I was just like, oh my God, I could do that. So really make sure you seek challenges and then you build from that to build your self-confidence as an individual. The last thing I will say, know what you want, but also what, why you want it. The truth is I could have easily uh, stay, I could even after my fellowship finish, stay as a, an academic and evolve the ladder because I am capable of evolving on the ladder. But is that really what I want? Once I knew that is not what I want, and I, I, it took me time to identify what I want. But when I realized I wanted to pursue this business, until I had clarified why I wanted it, my energy and the, 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 my determination was like 50, 40%. Once I had that clarity that for me, this business is a way to empower women, to empower young girls to actually appreciate themselves and the whole process of actually self-love and self-acceptance. That's, that's the one thing that, you know, in the hard moment, because entrepreneurship is hard. I mean, the whole process of r and I'm working on this for the last five years, four years, because you're inventing something that doesn't exist. And so there are some moments that are just like, you know, what are you doing with your life? You know, you could just get a job. But I remember why I do it. And when I remember I do it, the energy go back up and I'm like, let's go, you know? So those are three things I would like to uh, leave you with and to reflect and I look forward to receive your questions and hopefully engage with some of you through my product review. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to listen to me. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, well, before I hand it, well, I'm going to hand it over to Prue Butterworth next. I'm going to save my questions for you for the end, just so I have enough time to fit in the presentations. And then um, Prue is going to be followed by Paula Burns, who's from the Cardiff University. So I think it's Students' Union. The Enterprise Department is not the East Union, it's all Cardiff University, sorry. So they help students who are interested in starting their own businesses themselves. They did provide some support for my um, ambassador helping me get it from well create a business plan essentially so they can help you and obviously Prue afterwards can also help you launch so over to you Prue. Thank you thank you very much um, so my name is Prue Butterworth and um, uh, a lot, a lot like um, Yumna, I kind of wanted to go down this path of exploring um, the term excellence and what excellence means to me. 
um, and I think many times we get tripped by the fact um, that we aspire to other people's excellence. Um, and so for me, excellence is really about maximizing every single opportunity you come by. And I actually feel really strongly about this. Um, and um, with that uh, in mind, I think um, I want to start with a, a, a phrase which I came across when I was at university um, over 25 years ago, and it's really stuck with me. Um, and I was going through a particularly hard time and I wanted to quit um, when one of the ladies who worked in the faculty office said to me, you didn't come this far to only come this far. And that phrase has stuck with me for 25 years. You didn't come this far to only come this far. Um, and so a bit about where I was before that and what led to that conversation. So um, I'm originally from Zimbabwe. Um, my family originally from Zimbabwe, um, but I initially came to the UK as a very young child, like at about three months of age um, and stayed here till the age of seven. Um, so I started my primary school here um, and then we went back to Zimbabwe. I don't really remember much about my primary school um, here. It was in London, Camberwell, a school that was called St. George's. Um, but I do remember very clearly that I was the only black kid in the school. That much I remember. Um, and I remember my mom had anxiety about it. Um, but to be really honest, I don't remember any negative experiences at school. I then went to Zimbabwe, which at the time had just newly become independent and black kids had just started going to school with white kids. And I went into a class, I went to a school called Hallingbury Primary School and there were four black kids in our class. And that is actually the first time that I remember feeling something isn't right here. Okay, so my experience is actually very different to um, a lot of the BAME community in the UK because actually when I think of my growing up in Zimbabwe, some of it was quite harsh, you know, um, and it's small things like I remember on the whole, we were all good friends because kids are in primary school. That our last year of primary school is called grade seven. And I remember deciding very early that in that grade seven holiday must be when white kids get told by their parents that it's no longer okay to play with black kids. Because that was definitely the time when all of a sudden the friendships came to an end. There was no going to each other's houses after school and there was no, and it was weird and it was evident and no one spoke about it. You know, it's just the way it is. Um, I then um, went through my um, secondary education in Zim and then came back to the UK uh, for my university. Um, and again, I would be lying if I said that I felt um, on a day to day basis um, that my race. Um, uh, had a negative impact on me. Um, but some of that is probably because um, I, one of the things I always think is what can I do? I can't affect what another person does, but what can I do in any situation? What can I do? And I remember having a really awkward time. I, I started off at Nottingham Trent University um, where um, someone in the department for, for, for reasons I still don't know kind of you know, took against me. And it was one thing after another. First, it was, you know, um, she went into this big launch about whether or not I was entitled to home student fees. And, and you know, despite the fact that I had British citizenship from when I came for and this person had a, a personal vendetta on me. And through it all, I just kept thinking, what can I do? What can I do to, to you know, to stop this? What can I do to give you the evidence you need? What can I do for this? What can I do for that? And it was only actually when I left Nottingham Trent University that someone said to me, I feel really bad that we basically let someone push you out clearly because of your race. And it hadn't even, it really hadn't occurred to me, not for one second, because all I was thinking was, what can I do? 
I then found myself at Loughborough University, um, not knowing how I was going to pay for my education. <laughs> Um, I had um, just enough, just about enough to see me through um, the first year um, and then I didn't make things easy for myself by falling pregnant in the second year of um, university um, and you know doing the only thing that I believe to be right and keeping the pregnancy so I was basically pregnant um, on an engineering degree so Already, I'm outnumbered in terms of being one of a few females on the course. Um, I'm one of a few black people on the course. And then I go and complicate things for myself um, by being pregnant on the course. Um, and at that point, I said to the lady in the department, I, I don't think I can continue. And she said to me, you haven't come this far to only come this far. Um, and I've already said that stuck with me. Um, one of the things that I've then gone on to believe and kind of stuck with throughout my career is it's kind of my motto is you can have it all. And I truly believe that it doesn't matter what it is you aspire to. I really believe it's yours. You can have it all maybe not at the same time, you know, <laughs> but you can have it all. And if there's anything I actually just want to leave with you guys is whatever you get the opportunity to do, pursue it because you don't know where it's going to lead. I now run a go-to-market consultancy, um, which mainly works in an industry which is called ad tech, which is advertising technology. That's where most of my clients are based and where I started off. Ad tech as an industry didn't even exist when I was at university. Okay, so when someone said to me, you didn't come this far to only come this far, where I was going to end didn't exist. That term didn't exist. Okay, I spent um, most of my years in the corporate world being what's called um, a product marketer. Again, product marketing didn't exist when I was at university. There was marketing and that's it, you know. Now we've got digital marketing, performance marketing, brand marketing, product marketing, all ways that we can um, use the special source that we bring to the world to target and focus on what it is we really want to do. But we're only going to find out what it is we really want to do by not ignoring the opportunities that come our way. Um, so yeah, to those of you at university, if you get a chance to do something for a charity, etc., absolutely go for it. You absolutely never know what you'll learn and where that knowledge will lead. As part of um, Cambridge Go to Market, we basically um, help companies that have a new product to launch, to launch successfully in the UK. So our um, tagline is reducing your time to revenue. A lot of time clients engage with us at the point that they're about to give up where normally that what else can I do option and I always start our engagement by saying to them you come this far to only come this far and I really just want to leave that thought with you today. Oh, thank you very much, Pru. That was lovely. It actually reminds me of um, when I started university with um, Cardiff Uni. I only had my six-month-old son and I was fluent in Greek. So I took it upon myself to learn Spanish. And a, a professor called Belen Mungia Peacock would hold my son at the beginning of the class to keep him quiet so I could get on. And that turned into a translation degree, which now I'm on a master's. So... Yes, the importance of not giving up and you've brought up such an important issue also of if you do get pregnant on your course, um, it's not and at the end of the world. I've seen plenty of women do this and you know that there is student support that will help you with this. They've helped me with my mental health crises, my spat with domestic violence. They've helped me with such a lot, even if you're not in a stable house. There's so many things that you cannot predict that will happen to you 
during your university experience, mm. bereavement, you know, there are attacks, there are so many things. So Cardiff University is very supportive. And one last speaker who is all about support as well for all of you future ent entrepreneurs out there is Paula Burns from the Enterprise Department of Cardiff University. Welcome, Paula. Hi, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, and just great to see you guys on, on this session. Sorry, I was a little bit late coming in, but um, I'm not gonna keep you for long because I know that you probably wanna ask questions to all the amazing speakers. Um, but yeah, my name is Paula Burns and I'm from the Cardiff Enterprise team. So basically, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the team, um, but what we do is we support you with entrepreneurship. So it's basically to help you bring your business ideas to life so it doesn't matter at what stage you are you know you might be just at the seed of an idea or you might have started sort of putting ideas together and starting to build something or you might be even a little further along there's just lots of support within the enterprise team to help you move that business idea forward so we've got startup packages um, competitions um, there's online skills sessions that you can do so that there, there is so much support as Jessica mentioned um, within the team but I also wanted to tell you about um, some of the initiatives that we've some key initiatives that we've got going on at the moment um, so one of them is uh, is called Sunniad Sunniad um, competition and Sunniad is Welsh for idea and basically what we're looking for is for the students to share their idea um, of something that could possibly change the world that addresses climate change. Um, so it's quite a big thing for us, this competition, and we're just really looking for as many students to get involved with it. And um, the great thing is, is that as well as changing the world, you can also have the opportunity to win an iPad. So um, uh, the skills, what, what we're looking for, to do as well as to develop your skills in pres presentations, in pitching. Um, so to actually enter the competition, you would upload your pitch video, um, tell us what your idea is. There's some key um, areas for these ideas that we're looking to cover. So you, we were looking for your idea to sort of sit within one of these areas, um, whether it's material consumption, uh, food and diet, transport and mobility, or heating and cooling. So those are the criteria that we are looking for that possibly that your idea could fit into. Don't worry if you know you haven't got an idea that's all thrashed out and all ready to go. That's not what we, you know, we're not specifically looking for that. Um, you know, if you have, great. But if you've just got even a seed of an idea that you think this is this would be really good for the environment, I'd love to sort of put this idea forward. Um, there, um, there's an opportunity for you to enter that competition. Um, I'm going to drop all the links in the chat so you'll be able to go straight there and pick, find out a bit more about um, each of these things, more about the enterprise team, also more about Sunny Ad as well, the competition. Um, and also the other initiative that we've got going on at the moment. Um, the Sunny Ad competition ends on the 1st of March, so you have a little bit of time, but don't leave it to the last minute. Start sort of thinking about things and you can even start uploading your ideas or start the draft um, now and then come back to it. Um, time goes really quickly, as we know. Um, we've also got um, the other initiative is Emmeline, which is um, Welsh for onwards. And basically, M-Line is um, equivalent of a placement, but for individuals who want to be self-employed. So, you know, you know, normally if you're placed, you're placed in a company and you're going through that sort of placement period within a company because you're looking to aspire to, to go into that type of business, um, company or that type of work. With M-Line, we have created this for people who want to be self-employed and basically M-Line provides <coughs> structured support for you to take your business idea um, straight through um, the areas that you need to, what you need to do to bring that 
into fruition. Um, so you get regular um, uh, structured business mentoring sessions. Um, there's also 150 pounds um, to go towards your business idea. And you also get free membership membership to Ipsy as well. Um, prior to um, COVID, there was sort of co-sharing space opportunities within, um, you know, um, co-sharing co offices, office space. But what we have got now is um, joint social and networking groups that happen online. So it is really to totally support you in your self-employment journey. So um, Mline is an amazing um, opportunity. Again, as I said, I, I will drop a link. The closing date for Mline is the 6th of December, so you haven't got much time for that. So it's an, um, the idea is that you just um, go in, follow the link, and you can just fill in the application form and um, apply to get onto the placement. And this is for the next lot of um, students that we're bringing in. There are only 10 spaces. Um, I think sort of nearly half of them have gone already. So um, don't delay if you are thinking about maybe doing something like this or finding out some more about it. Okay. And that's that's it at the moment. I think what we the other thing we have got going on at the moment as well is the Welsh student market. And I don't know if um, any of you have heard about that. If you've already got a business and you already um, you have a website where you are selling, um, you can actually have a link on the Wales student market um, website that will take people over to your site. And it's also being promoted by the the university as well. So that's another great opportunity to get seen. There's so many great opportunities and that's a great, the good thing. I think somebody said earlier, um, you know, is it Prue that said don't, or, or um, no, I can't remember, one of you <laughs> said, you know, don't, do not miss an opportunity. Um, whatever opportunities are out there, just go for it. Okay, so thank you very much, Jessica. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, Okay, before we close the event, I will hand it over to Izzy, who will have the, uh, who will promote, sorry, address or chair, whatever you want to use, the Q&A. So that will be the last you'll hear from me. So I just wanted to say a huge Diochenbaur, thank you very much to our panelists for coming. Um, the reason why we put on this event was purely so we can have people to look up to, you know, so, and, and to be able to speak with you directly is not just an honor but it's absolutely important for us as a country and as a people so um thank you very much for that um for any of you who well just to let you know it is black friday so aaron wallace has um, some black friday discounts going and so does uh, manicure you if you're watching this on record unlucky but you can still buy from their um, <laughs> you can still buy from their websites, and you should always support black-owned products and businesses by paying full price anyway. So, but do take advantage of those exclusive deals for today anyway. And over to you, Izzy, for our Q and A. Thank you, Jess. Um, yeah, we just wanted to open this bit up to a few questions. If you guys have any, you can put them in the chat. You can um, mic yourselves and speak them yourself. Um, I think I just wanted to start with one question. Um, I suppose this is to all of you guys. Thank you so much for speaking, by the way. It's, it's brilliant to hear from you all. Um, from, I would just wanted to know, what, is, what has been the impact on so incentives like Black Pound Day? Have you seen an impact on your businesses? I suppose for Aaron Wallace and Manicure You Nails, it would be translated to higher sales. But maybe for Dr. Yuna Muhammad and and prove Butterworth, maybe that would be just more visibility for your business, more interaction with more people. I just wondered how, what's the importance of those incentives and have you seen an impact? Um, I've definitely seen an impact. I think that, that especially, especially the first Black Pound Day, the first Black Pound Day was absolutely insane. It, the first Black Pound Day was like, was like, literally like Christmas in terms of our sales volume. We done um we done I believe two months worth of sales in one weekend. So and it literally wiped out all of our stock. <laughs> so it was it was it was it was really unprecedented. It it was actually I mean it was it was really fantastic news but it was it was a 
it was a whole it's, it's, it was a whole thing because we had so many orders come out over that weekend that we was not expecting that kind of spike that we completely sold out all of our stock and then getting everything back in and customer it was it was wild it was crazy so um i think initiatives like that are really really beneficial for black businesses because it shines the spotlight on the business to begin with and it's just it's just that added incentive to support because unless we get that kind of support we won't exist and if we don't exist then those gaps that that are there in the market won't be serviced properly and we won't be able to serve it in a high quality way in a in a in a that that matches our competitors so it's really really good and really really key that we do support black black businesses with with our patronage yeah definitely would you agree with that you know and prue have you, have you seen an impact on your businesses do you think um so I haven't seen an impact on my business directly because a lot of um, I provide a lot of mentorship um, for people who you know aren't my ideal customer. And what I've actually seen is I think the focus on black businesses um, it's really good from the viewpoint that in the consumer's mind it gets them thinking you know, whatever it is I need, I want, can I get it from a black provider rather than from a big brand or, you know, et cetera. Um, but also from the business owner's mind, I do feel that these um, incentives make black business owners want to step up to the plate more. All of a sudden people are asking me, how do I stick up above the crowd? What do I do that's different than just Instagram? What do I, whereas, you know, before people seem to be quite happy trundling along, trying things that are tried and tested and everyone does. And now mm -hmm. I see a lot of people trying to be creative because it's like all the noise comes at once and therefore what do I have to do differently? So I'm getting lots of very interesting inquiries and seeing lots of creativity. That's brilliant. And I, I wanted to ask you as well, Prue, um, I suppose you would know just as well because of your vast market knowledge but the impact of social media I think social media is absolutely brilliant um, to bring awareness and exposure to businesses but also doesn't it increase the competitiveness in these businesses because everyone's on social media um, and now people are looking for businesses to purchase from which is brilliant but it just ups that market competition so Aaron hit the nail on the head earlier um, where he alluded to understanding what I call your ideal customer profile, um, your ICP. Social media is noisy. Mm -hmm. It will be a problem for you if you don't understand your audience and what it is you do for your audience that not just any Tom, Dick and Harry can do. Once you understand that and understand um, the terms your audience use when referring to the problem that you solve, um, where they look for solutions, et cetera, it becomes a lot easier. And you might actually find that the social media channels that you use aren't the ones you should be paying money to. Right. That's really interesting. Thank you for answering that. Um, we have a question from Reese in the chat, and this is for Aaron. So he says, you felt the need to find a solution for your customers. Not everyone goes that extra mile. Why do you think you took action? Was it based on previous, previous experiences or lessons? Um, I think the, the reason why I went the extra mile is because it was just kind of the vision that I had. And it, it was the kind of, initially, it was the service that I wanted to provide. I wanted to provide a service that goes above and beyond. So... Like I said, I began with the um, with the with the premise of a quality premium barbershop, and what you'll find in most premium quality barbershops is they'll always have a retail section, uh, a shelf of products for their customers, so that after they finish the haircut, they can offer them quality customers to keep the hair looking quality even when they go home. So I always knew that there was a in the brand that I'm trying to build, there's a there's a gap for that. 
but it really came just through having conversations with the customers like that's what was really like wow no there is actually a this opportunity is bigger than just the barbershop because if all of these customers that I'm servicing are having these very similar issues then I know that these issues are are being felt by black men all over the country and black men outside of London are probably suffering even more and black men that are in Germany are probably having the same issues so it's like you start to think wow like no this is actually there's a lot of black men that are going to be facing these problems so let me just put everything into creating something that solves that on a on a on a larger scale and it's, it was kind of it it was kind of just a, a journey like a, a continual thing like it wasn't like I just sat and had the whole thing mapped out from the big beginning it's kind of like this is where it is it's led me and and the maps kind of just grown as you as you go down as you drive down that road yeah yeah, because as you said, even with the name, it, it took a whole big thing to decide on the name. I, I saw Mom. you are um, really. <laughs> it's yeah. it, it it really matters. The name matters, <laughs> and it it would mm-hmm. take. I'd be sitting on that for years. So um, yeah, yeah. But I, I saw you on social media, um, um, and I saw you go live with I think it was an American organization. Is it WH Shop or something? And I was listening. It was just really interesting. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It absolutely. Yeah. And it's yeah. great to see that so you're we're in. Um, uh, we're expanding into some US. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. It's great to see that you're expanding now because I can, yeah. I can see the thing is it's a universal thing, and there's a gap in the market universally with black men. So that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned that it was really hard for you in the start um, to, as a small business to gain the trust of manufacturers because they have these massive quotas. And I just thought yeah. that was really interesting. I don't know if um, you, know, you have a similar experience with that. And how, because you're in the starting phases of your business, you're just getting started, you're just figuring out the products. What's been your experience so far with with getting big organizations on board and in every aspect of building that business from the ground up? Um, it's been a, quite an adventure, as I said. The, the, it, it takes a process because um, you have really to go to the, and once you have the idea, in this case, I needed to go to the inventor space, a step. And uh, uh, having a designer, you know, an engineer to actually design is actually lots of, lots of money, like literally 10,000 K just to, to get a drawing and that's actually not the finished product. So what I did is I worked with local spaces such as like fabrication labs, like, you know, because I needed people with skills of designing, but also 3D printing machines and stuff like that. So I worked with local uh, local uh, designs house that were actually uh, cheap, like in university mainly. Once I actually uh, uh, got something in hand, I tried it myself and I was like, this, this is not working. And we carry on that process, that iterative process until we got something that actually was functional, but just the most important thing is the whole concept of having a minimum viable product. It's just kind of like test whether the concept is viable or not. When I was able to do that, my, what I did is I invited 20 women because my idea, my focus is, I wanted to know, is this something that is needed or is it just me being, being picky? Is it just me being lazy? And so I invited 20 women over two days in Swansea to actually come, test it and give me feedback. And I was quite overwhelmed at the end because the, the, the feedback was so positive with all of them saying, oh my God, I'll, I'll definitely buy this. And I was just like, oh my God, you actually have a good idea. And I'm, you need to pull it through, you know, in a way it's almost like you get a pass if it's like, oh, no, nobody wants it, you're just like, okay, that's it. But now you actually need to pull the energy to, to go there. So it was still quite tough because I needed funding to actually have more design work and regarding, you know, having a minimum viable ID is very different to having a product. So the process of R&D, having something that works and something that is actually user-friendly is a very time-consuming process. And I just didn't have the money. So I actually equity funded. I found a design engineer and I actually give him equity in the company for him to do the work. And from there, um, I went on and actually uh, filing the patent myself with my own savings because you need to protect your idea in, in this process. 
and that was done. I, I just kept on going on, you know, with the with the engineer and then trial and error. I gave it to people. I'm, I've always been in the process of I need to hear what how women feel with this product. So I gave it to women, and then it gave me feedback again. And and we still needed some work done. But my engineer is a um, a man with an engineering hat. You know, he's a great engineer, but not really much of a designer. So lately, we had we getting the support of an amazing design house in in Cardiff which really gonna take things to at the next level, like regarding the user friendliness. And that's actually the design that we wanna trial. So the process can be quite, um, quite uh, tedious uh, as a, if you're going from an, in, uh, as, as an inventor, but I think, you know, you just always have to be uh, creative into whether you can find money in my case, it's unfortunate there was lots of help around London, but not many in Wales. It is really hard to actually get accelerator program that will give you money in Wales. It's all about support and stuff like that. So you just have to be very creative. So I use, um, I have a, I have a very, uh, how can I say, small life, but because most of my saving went into taking my ID off the ground, and uh, and so I was so happy to receive the fellowship because for once it's been now for five months where my entire energy is on the business before that i was always having the heart between the researcher and the heart between the entrepreneur so uh, there are opportunities like that that you need to go and seek find accelerator program and just bring in the people and find form of agreements where you can actually get the skill to keep to keep moving literally creativity into getting the help that you need is essential. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Reese is asking as well, where do people need to go to participate in your trial? Can they just go on social media? So literally, I'm going to launch it uh, by this afternoon, uh, but it's already live already on the website. If you go simply on the website, mayanandnatural.com, uh, you will see a massive button. We say register for the trial and it will take you to the right page. So we're just going to ask simple questions to just make sure that we are, we're going to be recruiting the right people with the right kind of like a market that we, uh, the right customer that we want to serve. So uh, if you just go on mayanat.com, you'll be able to see it. You'll be Brilliant. ahead of lots of people. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, we'll just do one more question. This is for Aaron as well. Um, did you do you contact barbers and vendors directly, and how can we buy your products in Wales? In Wales, um, if you're a customer, the best, easiest way to get our products would probably be to just visit us on the website. So it's um, buyaaronwallace.com. So b y and then aaronwallace.com probably be the easiest way and like Jessica said we, we have our Black Friday weekend sale going on at the moment so you can get 25% off. Um, I do occasionally reach out to barber shops. Um, I see some on Instagram that look really cool I might reach out and drop them a message or retailers I might drop, um, drop them a message and, and um, collaborate that way. I find that um, as we as we grow more and more, reach out to us as well. So it's it's a it's a it's a two way thing. Sometimes I reach out to barbershops. Sometimes they reach out to us. Um, so if you have a barbershop in your area that you think would um, benefit from stocking us for the men around in in your in your vicinity, then yeah, um, send them our way. Send them to the website. Drop us an email at um, hello at Aaron Wallace, by AaronWallace.com and then we can take it from there. So we um, we do stock at quite a few barbershops. I'm based in London, so we've kind of, I've been focused on the London area. I haven't got out to Wales just yet. So <laughs> I would actually very much appreciate if you um, put me in contact with any barbershops that you have in the area. So yeah. that'd be great. Brilliant, thank you. And of course, we can't forget to mention our own um, Jessica, our co-chair and her business. As she mentioned earlier, I don't know if you mind me saying, but with dyslexia, you're fluent in multiple languages. You're still studying. You've studied, you know, raising your child, all these, all these obstacles to go through. And you've absolutely established and are killing this business. So let's not forget to mention Jessica um, Ambassador. She's on Instagram. She's got a website, translation. She'll help you go into these markets in any language, any region, because she will translate for you. She's got consultants, you know, all that. So have a look on her Instagram, um, brilliant. But just like to say thank you so much, you guys, for coming for um, and speaking with us. Um, as I say, this has been recorded and we'll get that on our Cardiff University YouTube channel, which 
can be out for everyone to see. We'll distribute it throughout the university. So if people couldn't be here today, they'll definitely hear from you. And we did say we're in the middle of Black Friday. So I'll be sending out the codes you need to use for your business, Aaron, for you to get a discount um, for our students. So yeah, I'll be sending that out after this meeting. But just thank you so much, guys, for coming. Have a brilliant weekend. Have a brilliant Black Friday. And well done on your amazing businesses. <laughs> it's inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.